Good morning. Um, I'm pleased to present you uh, our work about how to measure the dispersion relations of spin waves using electrical measurements based on time of flight spin wave spectroscopy. This is a joint work between my group at C2N, Centre de Nanosciences et Nanotechnologie. This is in Université Paris-Saclay, France, and IMEC in Belgium. This is the outline of my talk. Generally, when people want to measure the band structure of spin waves within a given film or a given sample, they do it by brilliant light scattering, or if they have if they know the material parameters, they calculate the spin waves using micromagnetics. And the question that I want to address today is whether we can do that electrically. For this, I will display my I will illustrate my method with samples. And these samples are essentially inspired by the works of Demokritov and co-worker that have shown that if you use a magnetic stripe that is magnetized in a transverse direction, you can have several quantized spin waves within the widths of the, of the stripe. And these spin waves have a dispersion, have a complicated band structure where several spin waves coexist in the same range of frequencies and k vectors. So we'll show how we can make propagative, propagating spin wave spectroscopy in these types of samples, and I will show that the fact that we have many modes is a problem to directly interpret the data. And the problem can be circumvented by going in a time domain and performing time-of-flight sorting of the spin waves. So let's do electrical measurements of propagative spin wave spectrum of propagative spin waves. And for this, we rely on a spectrum analyzer that connects the two ends of an RF devices. And the core of the device here is this blue magnetic stripe made of 30 nanometer of cobalt iron bar. And what we do is we apply a strong field to magnetize it in the transverse direction and we define RF antennas on top in which we flow RF current to generate RF fields and generate spin waves that propagate to the receiving antenna. And the first question I want to address is in this type of experiments, what does the signal look? What's the signal we're looking at? And it's been detailed in many papers, including one of them by Susrut and co-workers that is very complete. Uh, showing that the transmission parameter, when there is a single spin wave branch that contributes to the signal, is the product of three functions. And the two most important are this antenna efficiency function that just depends on the geometry of the antenna and defined the envelope in frequency or in wave vector space in which it's possible to excite spin waves. And another term that is a propagative term where uh, it's a phase term uh, that is solely determined by the k-vector of the spin wave considered at the given frequency and the distance that it propagates. And indeed, it, gives a, it predicts a simple, simple spectra. And in many samples, this is really what happens. For instance, if I use a wide conduit, 30 nanometer thick cobalt iron boron, I typically have this kind of spectra. But in practice, Sometimes we have several spin waves that contributes to the system such that the resulting transmission coefficient is a sum, is a complicated sum over many spin wave branches that is complicated, that is potentially complicated. And for instance, if I reduce the lateral dimension up to a point where there's a strong quantization, there are several spin waves that contributes to the signal and the face of the transmission coefficients is now difficult to correlate with what would happen if there was a single branch uh, contributing. So now the question is how, in this complicated spectrum, how to identify the contribution of each spin wave in this ensemble. And for this, we do that by going in a time domain and calculating the impulse response. The principle is the following. When you do a VNA measurement, you measure the transmission coefficient from the input antenna to the output antenna at several frequencies, slow frequencies, fast and very fast frequencies. And from each frequency point, you reconstruct transmission spectra. But spin waves are the eigen excitation, the linear eigen excitations of a system. And when a system is linear, if you know the response of this system at every frequency from zero frequency up to infinity, 
you can calculate the response that it would have to any time domain stimulus. And this is what we do. So we calculate what would be seen at the receiving antenna with an oscilloscope if we were to apply a strong Dirac excitation at the input antenna. Okay. And we would see, effectively, the different spin wave wave packets arriving sequentially. First the fast, then the, then the slower spin wave wave packets. So, for instance, if we use this spectrum that I've showed several times, and we calculate the impulse response, so this is signal versus time, we indeed have a first wave packet arriving before the first nanosecond. These are the fast spin waves. And if you're patient, you will see the slow spin waves and the very slow spin waves arriving after. Okay. So we are now able to separate the different wave packets, but we've lost information on their frequency and wave vectors. And we need to recover that information. And this is done by time gating, as explained in the following slides. So consider that we still have this row data frequency domain spectrum with the corresponding time domain impulse response. You can see that this time domain impulse response contains the contribution of every spin wave from the fast to the slowest one, but also contains electromagnetic coupling between the antenna and some noise. And what we are interested to do is to isolate the contribution of its spin waves. So we will just gate and use the signal of the first wave packet and recalculate the corresponding frequency spectrum. We can do that for the second wave packet and for the third wave packet. And for each of these wave packets, calculate the transmission spectrum that we would have recorded on the spectrum analyzer if there was a single spin wave in the system. And each of these, each of these spectrum looks like very much the single mod model so that indeed we can unwrap the face of these spectra now and provide the k-vector versus frequency, so the dispersion relation. And this is done, for instance, in this case, uh, for a 5 micron conduit. And here we show the dispersion relation that is obtained, that is deduced from the experiment as the bold curve, and it matches very well, which was, can be expected with a simple damage bar tier. And this leads me to my conclusion. We've used time of flight spin wave spectroscopy by implementing time gating on the transmission spectra. And this is a fast and efficient way of determining the band structure in a way that provides similar results to what you could have been done by real one light scattering, but now this is done purely electrically. And the analysis is based on the fact that the defacing of the transmitted spin wave is just due to the propagation. So it works if there are, you have several spin waves in the system, provided they have different group velocities. For instance, it's not a problem if you have band crossings. It may be a problem if you have non-monotonic dispersion curves. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and more details are given in the following reference here. Thank you.